All right. So good evening, uh, everyone who has joined us. Um, on behalf of Endeavor Careers, I welcome all of you to Symposium 2020, and this is the part two of the symposium where we are going to talk about the new age career options after class 12th, 2020, and beyond. Since you have already joined, you know the importance of this webinar, but still, if you have any doubts about the importance of doing such a webinar in times like these, it is extremely important only because Every year, around 1.5 crore students appear for their 12th standard exams, their HSC exams. And any guesses how many of them actually know about the career options that are available to them? It's hardly 5% of them, and not more than that, who know what they want to do after their class 12th. And this is not only the students, it's also about the teachers and the parents because the information keeps changing. Um, and in times like these, where COVID-19 has taken over and a pandemic is right there, it becomes all the more difficult because the admission processes, the dates might, might have changed. So in this webinar, Symposium 2020, Endeavor Careers is trying to connect the students, parents, and the institutes. And it's a first of its kind digital symposium to which I welcome all of you. Uh, we have speakers from reputed institutes who would be joining us. And while they speak, if you have any particular questions which you want to ask them, you can WhatsApp us. Our number is 9099-720-214. Uh, we'll keep repeating this number. We have our first speaker right here with us. Um, he's Dr. Nigam Dave. He's the director of School of Liberal Studies, CDPU. So here's a virtual welcome to you, Nigam, sir, on behalf of Endeavor Careers. Um, I'm privileged. Thank you. Um, if I introduce Dr. Dave, he looks after various academic and administrative profiles at PDPU. He is also the head of Office of International Relations and has visited a number of countries with delegations from the Institute and representing the government as well. Um, over to you, Dr. Dave. Um, please talk to our students, parents and teachers who have joined us for the symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, you're good to go, sir. Uh, Ma'am, the screen sharing option you need to allow. Uh, yeah, you can do it from the green button on your screen. It says. No, no that's fine. I see here host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh oh, okay. Let me see. Um... Okay, here we go. So friends, um, good evening to you all and uh, wonderful to have you here. Uh, as the theme, I would first start talking about the new age careers and uh, then how at School of Liberal Studies, the pedagogical advantages one can have. So we started our journey at Pandit Dindayal Petroleum University as you can see, I show you the brief snapshot of what our campus is. It's a 100-acre lush green campus on the Knowledge Corridor situated in Gandhinagar. And uh, at PDPU, we house the faculty, faculty of uh, management, faculty of technology, and faculty of liberal studies. We started our journey in School of Liberal Studies uh, in 2009 and we are on our way to induct the 12th batch this year. While we, uh, I mean, any counseling that I give to parents and students, their end purpose is to get a good career. Now, while the end goal is the same for all, to get a good career, the definition of good career varies from people to people, because I always say amusingly that English dictionary have two separate words on two separate pages, success and happiness. So we are always on the lookout for something that gives us success and something that gives us significance. So I say that human life is comprised between B and D, that is birth and death, 
but between B and D, we have C, a choice. So when it is uh, talking about our future career, we always have a lot of questions and parents and students ask me, where do you see my son or daughter? Uh, yes. I smile and say I prefer not to because times are changing very, very fast. And as we all know, we are ushering into the fourth revolution. In fact, we are already in the fourth revolution. And this fourth revolution is called Industry 4.0, wherein the world is mostly governed by IoT, augmented reality, Internet of Things. And right now, I mean, in the case of pandemic, uh, we are proven right because we are meeting virtually through the interface of uh, uh, cyber technology. So human beings fear that in the world of industry 4.0, most of the manual as well as uh, the human jobs, even the creative jobs would be taken away by machines. And uh, we always find uh, the caution given to us on the side glass of our car, where it is written that the objects in the side mirror are closer, closer than they appear. Likewise, this disruption that we are going to anticipate in uh, the world of industry 4.0 is much, much nearer than we can anticipate right now. And therefore, with the demanding times, we require demanding skills. So I say this is not the time of leapfrogging wherein we have time to modify our career interest and our skills. These are the times of pole vaulting. And how do we pole vault? What are the new age careers that we see? Uh, as you can see on your screen, some of the interesting careers that are emerging in front of us. Right now, some of these careers might look ridiculous and uh, far too advanced, but I'm very sure that in the days to come, most of these careers would be very, very relevant. Careers like uh, the digital rehab coach or the career where the person would work as senior citizen companion or senior citizen caretaker. Uh, the alternate health therapy would, would come in a big manner because um, we have created a lot of issues uh, to our recklessness and carelessness and uh, COVID-19 is one such example. So people would be trying to find out alternate health therapies also. The digital music, musical expert is something uh, we find a lot of uh, songs are being trans transferred and uh, they have the new even right now Endeavor and uh, my friend moderator who was helping me. Uh, actually, we are meeting through the human, human machine uh, interface and this human machine interface is something that uh, people would be looking for. So I'll, I'll talk about some of these careers very briefly and uh, then talk about some of the skills that would be required. So what are the skills that people would find out. We are passing through a very critical phase of uh, COVID-19 and hopefully we will overcome this very soon. When we overcome this, uh, we need to understand whether it is the uh, millennials or the boomers or generation X, Y or Z, whatever it is, people are going to grow old and with the type of lifestyle and the smaller family size that we have, there would be huge demand of people who would have an understanding of uh, the human behavior, the psychological understanding of senior citizens, empathy, and a lot of other things. So the youth who can handle not just the travel, being the travel companion for the senior citizen, but also helping senior citizens uh, to various service would be in a lot of demand. Another that I see in demand is uh, right now it is okay because we are passing through the lockdown phase and uh, we are using a lot of data. But world over, parents and uh, 
the guardians are very much worried about the, the use of the data that people are spending every day. And more and more people are complaining of frustration and anxiety that comes through the extended prolonged contact with social media. So every family will be requiring the services of the digital detox coach. These coaches would prepare the tailor-made schedule for family and uh, individual of how much time they should be spending on social media and uh, what social media um, they should be spending time on and how much time should people actually spend outside so that they uh, stay healthy in uh, body also. Another career that I see that would be coming up in a big manner is that of being organizational disruptor. Because um, I, I was just teaching Brave New World to some of my students of English literature. And in Brave New World, there is a catch slogan that mending is better than ending. But it no longer stands true because all organizations are passing through a lot of changes. Whether these changes are forced, whether these changes are same style working is not going to work. So with the organizational disruption around, people would be hiring the experts who would understand the organizational behavior, the working of trans, uh, transnational companies, human psychology, and the aspects of marketing and business. So the organizational disruptors who would change the entire working system of an organization would be in huge demand. Also, it's not just the product brand that we are talking And a uh, lot of big people, they require a personal brand manager. These personal brand managers um, maintain close attention on hashtag trends going around, the newsmakers, what are the news happening all around the world, and what should be a proper way of communicating. So an excellent interpersonal communication ability uh, and street smartness can help one to become the personal brand manager. And we are already seeing how um, different cricketers and film stars and the politicians are using the help of personal brand managers. Okay, um, another thing that uh, I see in a big way coming up is uh, agriculture. And you may wonder that I'm here to talk about liberal studies and why am I talking about agriculture and floriculture? Um, so the purpose of talking about liberal studies is it, it gives you the pedestal of transdisciplinary understanding and then you capitalize it or to go on for a special business. So an understanding of food geography, culture, uh, and uh, various aspects of agriculture like hydroponics and uh, organic food would be in a lot of demand. Um, also, as we are passing through critical time and a lot of people are talking about anxiety syndrome, frustration, depression, and you might be uh, surprised to know that one of the most successful courses at Harvard University is a course on happiness. So in the days to come, the society would require the help of a memory surgeon. This memory surgeon with the understanding of the human psychology, culture, the political scenario, the economic position, economic possible economic breakdown and all, would try to erase the trauma and negative memories from people's mind and would try to bring back happiness. Um, also, um, at School of Liberal Studies at PDPU, we teach international relations as in political science. But I see in next uh, 10, 15 years, we would be uh, in a lot of demand for the political experts of the outer space. As you see, uh, our scientists in ISRO are making huge leapfrogging and pole vaulting towards advancement in science. And uh, those days are not very far where the mega powers would not be competing for the natural resources on the planet Earth, but would also be competing for the natural resources on the outer space. So the understanding of the politics of outer space would be the new age career that we see. Also, I was talking initially about human machine team manager. And as you see on the screen, uh, the maximum command that Alexa is getting in India is to play Hanuman Chalisa. Uh, so the cyber human interface is something that is connected with 
the culture deeply rooted culture so the understanding of the human machine team manager would help the um, programming officers and uh, the people who work on algorithms to work with machines that help human beings in a wonderful manner and uh, shoot not only just the local requirements or the national requirements but the international requirements as well okay so having talked about this some of this um, careers that might be coming you might be wondering then which discipline to go for or which area should i go for i say that uh, the selection of a major and minor is relevant but that's not as relevant as an understanding of uh, the skills that might be required if, if i give you the metaphor the metaphor that i would like to throw to you is that of a container and the content the container may change but the content is crucial so the gold per se as a metal is more important than the pounds of whatever gold ornaments that people wear so what would be the skills that would be in perennial demand irrespective of whether we are talking about uh, current phase or whether we are talking about 20 years down the line what would be the skills that people would require skill number 1 is excellent interpersonal communication ability and uh, ability to connect to people to understand what people require second would be multilingual ability when i say multilingual ability i am not counting english as a foreign language at all because english is almost an indian language now so what are the where is the development coming from or where are the problems coming from the understanding of languages like japanese or mandarin or french or spanish would be very much critical because we are not just competing i tell my students we are situated on bajipura road and i tell my students that we are not competing with bajipura boys and girls we are competing with the global task force and as such multilingual ability is something that everybody needs to have the problem solving ability of working in a heterogeneous transdisciplinary group where you are not just working with uh, people of your area or your discipline but with many other people a spatial intelligence by spatial intelligence i say the ability to join the jigsaw puzzle i'll just give one example if one is uh, aspiring to become a good manager manager at the end of the day would be working with human beings so the understanding of human psychology is important the understanding of the economic uh, policies of the country is important the understanding of Uh, the diplomatic relation one's country has with neighboring countries is important the understanding of culture is important so everything down the line is connected so no um, uh, working in silos that is my recommendation um, trans disciplinary approach to all challenges industry exposure because uh, theory must be complemented with uh, the real time challenges or uh, how people are solving these challenges in industry the research exposure for the undergraduate students is something that is very very essential your cv should have some paper presentations dissertations and uh, the inclination to research the advanced digital literacy is something that people would require and one thing that i take as a compliment is street smartness because you might be a scholar but if you are not street smart then you might not be able to sell your own personal brand so these are the things that would be required now talking about very briefly about what the school of liberal studies at pandit dindyal petroleum university offers in terms of courses we have uh, in tech of 460 students out of which 280 seats are reserved for ba bba commerce ba bba students 120 seats are reserved for bcom students and uh, 60 seats are reserved for bsc students now let me tell you how this functions and why we call it liberal studies we call it liberal studies because unlike traditional courses where you need to decide even before you make a start of what your specialization would be and sometimes that can be suicidal so for example in uh, 1988 when i went to st javier's college and i just blindly said that i would take english as my major i did not know whether i would be successful in english or not or whether english would have career or not and uh, i i also did not know what was my core competence so here at school of liberal studies in liberal studies pedagogy we allow students to enter undeclared so they enter without declaring their specialization first two years they are exposed to 45 courses out of which they have to take up 30 courses some are core courses some are electives which expose them to the wide gamut of courses um, 
to provide them a fair understanding of what they are good at. So basically, it gives you time to understand what you are good at, to be patient with yourself, and to find out where your career inclination lies. Um, and when you come in your fifth semester, that is the beginning of a third year, that would be the time where you would be deciding your major. Major is specialization and minor is sub-specialization. So on your screen, you see uh, you have the choices of economics, English literature, dominance in public administration, international relation, mass communication, and psychology as BA major minors. And in BBA honors, we have finance, marketing, and HR. Now, let me tell you how this is crossing happens. I can pick up finance major. I, my uh, career path would be BBA finance, but I can also take up English literature or corporate communication as my minor from the BA basket. And likewise, I can pick up international relation major and can combine it with the BBA minor. So this way students have a lot of flexibility even when they go for their major minor selection. Um, to talk about BCom honors program, the BCom honors majors are specialization, um, clusters are accountancy and finance, marketing and management, banking and insurance and international business and entrepreneurship. While these majors are restricted for the BCom students, the BCom students again can opt for minors from BA. So the BCom student can pick up one major from this the cluster that you see on your screen in BCom table, and then can also pick up from BA honors minor. That's not mandatory for them, but that's a choice that we are giving to them. And uh, for BAC, there are three disciplines that we offer, physics, chemistry, and maths. And uh, BAC students opt for their pathway from the second year. We also have postgraduate programs in economics, English, public administration, political science, international relation, mass communication, and psychology. And I would uh, stop my presentation with the pedagog pedagogical advantage that I would want to talk about. Uh, when I say pedagogical advantage, how liberal studies is different. So uh, the factor number one is liberal studies has to be non-judgmental. A person might not be very good in all disciplines, but person can be excellent in some area. Uh, the, the inherent philosophy of liberal studies is not to find out faults, but to find out the core competence and strength of the student and to guide the student towards that. So we uh, expose students to a lot of internships. At the end of first semester, um, in December, the students embark for one month residential rural internship, which they initially don't enjoy. But then the purpose is if you want to lead India, you need to understand India first and we want to take campus to the community and labs to lands. So the students stay at, with an NGO for one month and they solve some of the real time issues, grassroots issues of the rural community. During summer, we encourage and facilitate corporate internship for students so that they gain some experience of working with the industry. Also for every undergraduate student, irrespective of the degree pathway, uh, writing dissertation is mandatory. So that exposes them to the research experience. At PDTU, we have a specialized Office of International Relation. We call it OIR. And uh, one of the beautiful things that we do is we don't offer scholarship on past or class base, but we sponsor every student whose paper is accepted for presentation in a country abroad. So we tell students that you show your merit, you submit your papers, and go and make paper presentation. And the idea is to make every student having some double exposure. Uh, we also conduct audit activities during Saturday and Sunday. These are skill enhancement activities which students enjoy, like martial art, uh, tie and dye, bandhani making, Japanese kite making, bio safety drill, and a lot of other activities that the students have choices on. We send our students in summer for international exposure in campus abroad for one month, which is partly subsidized by the university. We also sponsor four students for semester abroad in uh, Minnesota University in US and Oklahoma University in US. Um, in fact, uh, the neutral third party scholarship of US consulate, which is known as U grade scholarship, is uh, acquired by students the so last five years back to back. Students of School of Liberal Studies have got that um, fellowship and scholarship. We also send up students for a lot of field trips in SARC countries and um, 
a lot of extracurricular activities. I, I hate this term, extracurricular and co-curricular, because nothing is extra, nothing is co. In fact, extracurricular and co-curricular are also curricular. They are because they are mainstream, they are associated with academics. We have an excellent studio, audiovisual studio, media studio. The student can real um, experience of being in a television studio and can record, show, Or what we have been doing, I would be personally interested in uh, solving some of the questions that you may have. Hello. Uh, Hello. Yeah, can you see and hear me? Um, okay, am I audible, Dr. Dave? Hmm. Yeah, am I audible now, Dr. Dave? You, you are audible. Okay, so uh, thank you so much for that lovely session. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions that have already reached me. Uh, so let me start with the first one. It says uh, difference between uh, BBA liberal studies and BA liberal studies. What's that? Uh, in fact, the philosophy of liberal studies stops me in answering this question because no discipline is higher, no discipline is uh, lower. Every discipline has its own merits. So the difference between BA and BBA, uh, as the name entails itself, when you uh, select finance, marketing, or HR as your major. Hmm. When we say major, major is depth. So you are studying number of hours in a managerial area, in management area. But along with that, why I'm slightly um, um, not in favor of uh, calling one higher or another lower is even a BBA student can pick up BA minor. Right. So the main problem with our contemporary society is because we have only seen the watertight compartments like BAs, BA and BAs, BBA. Whereas at School of Liberal Studies or in any good liberal studies uh, organization, what you would see is you are a BBA student, no doubt, but you are also studying theater in the first semester. You are also being exposed to fine arts or world civilization, uh, the areas of international relation, and you also have the liberty to pick up BA minor. The only difference that I would say is there are basically two types of people. It would, it would be slightly improper to classify people in category, but for the understanding of people out there, let me say there are, there are two types of people. People who are uh, very creative, who are people-oriented, who are people's person. For them, BA honors is very good, whereas there are people whose mathematical understanding is slightly better. Uh, who would want to go and expand their business and uh, want to start their own business um, activities for them BBA honors is better. Okay. I hope I will answer the question. If you still have a question, I'll be very happy to answer. Sure. Um, I'll be taking up more questions. So one student is asking, can I do minors in music while doing BBA from PDPU? Sorry, I'm, I'm not. It, it, he's saying, can I do minors in music while doing BBA from PDPU? Uh, unfortunately, right now, no. We have electives in music and we are thinking of starting music major from 2022. So okay. right now, music is not one of the options for major minor. Having said that, we have an excellent performing arts room with all musical amenities. In fact, I myself, with the director, I play keyboard. So I'm also personally interested in music, but right now that option is not available. Great. Um, there's one question which says, how much time throughout the four years will I find for pursuing my hobbies and interests? I'll be very happy to answer that. In fact, uh, uh, the new education policy recommendations are already on uh, the internet. 
So anybody can search and find out about the new national education policy that experts are recommending. Yeah. World over, any honors program is always comprised in a four-year program. Point one, um, uh, it helps people seamlessly integrating their further studies in countries abroad. Right. And we have partly understood this in India because our engineering programs are four years. Hmm. But all these years, we have been slightly uh, neglect, uh, we have been neglecting BA, BBA, BCom, and traditional programs, saying that these courses are not professional courses. I hate this term because even a musician can be a professional, even a cricketer can be professional. So the four-year structure is ideally structured around providing equal balance to people in breadth as well as in depth. Otherwise, you end up in a position where people would start taunting you that you are Jacopal but master of none. Whereas mm -hmm. I say very proudly that my students are Jacopal and master of at least one. Right, right. Um, okay, I'll take one more question. Uh, will the exams be conducted on the same dates that were announced earlier or does this situation bring along any change in that? I would be fearing this question. I knew that this question would come. So right now, the global situation is uh, very volatile. Uh, although we have an entrance examination and the forms are already out and a lot of people have already applied, we have been closely keeping in touch with and we have also put a instruction for all the possible applicants also that we are monitoring the situation very closely. Hmm. As on date, it doesn't look too promising to conduct the entrance examination as we have been doing. Uh, but let me tell you the alternate uh, solution that we are thinking for entrance examination is we would be asking students to submit uh, SOP, statement of purpose, letters of recommendation. We will be conducting their video interviews. Mm -hmm. And then as and when the 12th result is declared, that would be bring in the admission. But the previously announced admission process If you test of 50 marks, creative essay for 25 marks, and personal interview for 25 marks, and we have our test centers all across India. But right now it looks too bleak to me. I hope that I would be proven wrong. Right. And uh, can you just touch upon the dates related to the forms and the exam once again, and for the students who have joined us? Sorry, can you, can what, you repeat that again? If you have any important dates that you want to share for the forms or for the exams. The dates, current uh, announced dates are there already there on the website. We were proposing to conduct the entrance examination in the end of May, but that looks improbable right now. So I will be very honest. We are not very sure of uh, the exact timeline, but we'll be updating everyone through our website, through our social media, as well as those who have already applied. We're keeping our fingers crossed globally. Right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Dave. I think um, because of the limitation of time that we are facing, I would have to wrap up. But uh, I'm sure the website is updated with all the information that the students, teachers, or parents want to know more about PDPU that they, they can visit. So thank you so much for joining us. And... Um, we... Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Endeavor, and special thanks to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, students, teachers, and parents, for sticking around and listening to Dr. Dave. Uh, this is Symposium 2020, where we are talking about the new age career options that we have today, and it's amazing to know how many options are possible after your 12th grade? All the courses, the admissions, all the details here in the first of its kind digital webinar. Um, our next speaker has already joined us. He's Professor Anand Prakash Mishra. He's the Director of Law Admissions at OP Jindal. Um, first of all, I virtually welcome you, Professor Mishra. And on behalf of the entire Endeavor Careers team, I'm extremely grateful that you decided to join us this evening. Um, while Professor Mishra joins us, um, let me introduce him to you. He has spent over a decade in the field of legal education. He has written a bestseller LLB guidebook for Delhi University and also taught extensively in law test prep. So 
years of experience and he's here to share that with us this evening. So um, I welcome you once again, sir, if you could um, just take, take over virtually the mic from here and interact with the parents, teachers and students who have joined us this evening. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure being here. And uh, to start with, I must congratulate all the students who have completed their class 12 studies and now ready for joining the universities, joining the higher education. Uh, my background is that of a lawyer. I studied law. Uh, way back in Delhi University in Campus Law Center. I did my LLM also from the Faculty of Law University of Delhi. And those were uh, days or years of the rise of legal education in our country. For last nine years, I have been with Jindal Global Law School. And uh, in this session, I will like to uh, say in 10 minutes, talk about uh, legal education and uh, about particularly the law option, the study of law and legal, uh, I mean, uh, the legal option for the students after class 12. And I will rather encourage the student to ask questions. So I'll be very happy to spend more time in taking up all the doubts or questions which might be there in the minds of our students or parents about the study of law or uh, legal profession. So uh, Jindal Global Law School, which I uh, represent and uh, where I work as a director of law admissions, it started in the year 2009. It was a very humble beginning. And uh, we started with 10 faculty members and 100 students. This year in 2020, it's uh, such a special year for us when the QS rankings put for the first time two Indian law schools in the list of world's best law schools. So never ever in the history of legal education in the world, any Indian law school could get into the global rankings. So since 2012, uh, the QS World University subject rankings started for law subject. And in the seven years, none of the Indian law schools could find a place. So I'm very happy to tell students today that in our country, now we have law schools, which are world-class, which compete with the best law schools in Asia, the law schools in Singapore, Hong Kong, mainland China, or even the law schools in the UK and Europe. If you look at the QA subject wise rankings, of law, you will find uh, Jindal Global Law School is placed in the 101 to 150 bracket. And National Law School of India University, Bangalore, is another Indian law school to break into top 200 law school, which is placed in top 151 to 200 bracket. So now there are two Indian law schools in the top uh, 200 law schools of the world. Uh, I must say it's a great time to study law. Uh, law has always been a very, very important area of study and work, but more so post liberalization and also post introduction of the five-year law program in the year 1987 and establishment of National Law School Bangalore. Uh, law has come to the center stage in a big way. When I joined my uh, LLB degree, at Campus Law Center in the year 2000. And uh, I see the students today in 2020, when they're going to study law, the entire legal sector, legal industry, legal practice, legal profession has completely transformed. Newer areas of practice uh, have emerged. A lot of transnational and global uh, legal practice is happening today, which was not the 20 years back. And in a way, law as a profession has moved to be a global profession today. 
traditionally law has always been a single jurisdictional study or single jurisdictional practice. If you do a, an LLB or a law degree in India, you study laws of India and you become a lawyer in India. That was the concept. And the same is true for all countries. Today, our, our graduates at Jindal, I find them qualifying New York bar exam, California bar exam, the bar exams in the UK, and even in Australia, there are lawyers working in law firms in London, in Sydney, in, uh, I mean, UAE, around the world, in New York, in Tokyo, all over. So legal profession has completely transformed and that gives a great opportunity for the students uh, to study law in today's time, and particularly when the option is available after class 12. Uh, in my experience uh, in higher education, in universities for the last 20 years or more as a student, as a faculty member, as an administrator, I must tell the students and parents that the five-year law program after class 12 could arguably be one of the finest undergraduate education and degree available in our country. Very, very few programs, be it like medicine and MBBS degree, or be it a degree in uh, architecture or engineering from a premier institution, could really match the rigor of what a five-year law degree uh, offers. The diversity of courses from environmental law and cor corporate law to human rights, to child rights, to gender justice, from uh, constitutional and administrative law to say criminal law, and even uh, areas which are emerging now, technology and law, cyber law, intellectual property rights, industrial designs, and today even artificial intelligence and robotics and machine learning. Law is a profession and a study which is ever, ever dynamic and emerging and evolving. So that gives a great opportunity for the students to think about the study of law. And uh, uh, I will be very happy to inform the students at our law school in Jindal, uh, we have a strong five-year BLLB honors and BBLLB honors program. We have a three-year LLB program after undergraduate degree. We also have a strong one-year LLM program uh, the students should be aware that uh, LLM or master's in law is now the only postgraduate degree in our country, which is offered in a one year time frame as a special uh, approval from the University Grants Commission. So we offer a strong one year LLM program as, as well. But most interestingly, this year we started a BA honors degree in legal studies. And that is something very unique for the first time in the history of law schools uh, and Indian law schools uh, venture to offer something which is not a law degree, which is not LLB, which is a B honors degree, which is a humanities and social science degree. You study courses in political science, philosophy, economics, sociology, a lot of social science courses, but all surrounding uh, law and legal studies. and. Uh, in a way that prepares the students to choose a three-year LLB program later if they want to study law and become a lawyer, or they simply move to other options of higher education. They can study management or business or finance, or they can move to social sciences, or even uh, uh, something like international relations or public policy or they can explore other areas of higher education. So these are few developments I wanted to share with the students. One more uh, point I would like to make before I start taking question is, it's very, very important to write more entrance exams. Today, when a student think about uh, studying law, 
they all go for writing the CLAT exam, and which is a major exam accepted by some 24 national law universities. And I believe every student, every law aspirant should write that. But many of the students miss writing other exams and later on they realize, actually I receive a lot of requests, hundreds of requests actually, who have not written our entrance exam, which we use for admission called LSAT India exam. And they seek admission on the basis of CLAT or ILET or some other entrance exam score and which our admission rules doesn't allow. So we accept only LSAT, which is law school admission test, which is actually the oldest law admission test in the whole world. It started in 1947 by Columbia University Dean. And today uh, the LSAT exam is accepted by over 200 law schools in the US, Canada, and Australia. And in, the, in India, it was brought by Jindal Global Law School. So I will strongly encourage the students who are thinking about law to must write LSAT exam and widen their options and also become eligible to study law at Jindal Global Law School. Now, few other uh, few questions which I am seeing students are asking. One is about their doubt whether to do a BALLB or a BBLLB program. And what's the main difference between the two? So let me tell you very clearly, a five-year law program is nothing but a five-year LLB degree. It's not a BA degree. It's not a BBA degree. It's not a BCom degree. It's an LLB degree of five years time. So it doesn't matter much whether you do a BA LLB or a BBA LLB or BCom LLB, you are not doing a BA or BB or BCom, but you, but you are doing an LLB degree. So my suggestion to the students and parents is you should think about the best possible law schools because many of our leading law schools do not even offer a BCom LLB or a BBA LLB degree. National Law School, Bangalore, Nalsar Hyderabad, NLU Delhi, NUJS Kolkata, NLIU Bhopal, none of the leading older national law schools offer even a BBA LLB degree. And uh, even we started with a BA LLB honors degree and now uh, we offer uh, uh, both BLLB honors and BBLLB honors degree. So what matters, what my suggestion to students is those who have studied commerce or business uh, in their class 11, 12th, they should think about studying uh, a BBA LLB or a BCom LLB program. And those who have studied humanities and sciences their primary preference should be a BLLB honors degree. At the same time, it's absolutely open that a student chooses to do a BLLB or a BBLLB. So, of course, both the programs are multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, and it's very, very important why a law school like Jindal Global Law School is very special because we are not a standalone law school. We are a university with nine different schools. And there is a lot of scope of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary studies uh, within the university. So our law students, while doing a BALLB or BBLLB or LLB degree, they can absolutely uh, choose to study courses in uh, social sciences, in business, in international relations, in journalism, even in liberal arts, they can choose courses from different streams of study. And that way they can build uh, their own interests in a, in, a, in a better way than standalone law schools. So that, that is why the leading law schools in the world, uh, be it Harvard or Yale or Columbia, or Oxford, Cambridge, they all are part of 
a larger university system with multiple faculties and departments, and none of them are standalone, uh, what is called law university concept, which we use here. So that's a strong advantage for the students uh, at our law school. And I believe law should always be studied in a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary setting. And that is where I feel uh, there is a significant advantage for the students who study at our law school. So I would like to take up more questions. Uh, um, yeah, thank you so much, sir, for that uh, lovely session. And I think it covered a lot of things that the students might already be confused about. Though there are some questions that have reached us. Uh, let's see how many we can. All cover. the remaining time I would like to give to questions. Definitely. So let's start with this one question. So there's a student who is asking who should opt for BA in legal studies. Okay. Uh, can I see the question, please? Yeah, it says who should opt for BA in legal studies. Oh, so basically, uh, in my view, a student who is absolutely clear in his or her mind that I have to take up law after uh, class 12, they should go for a five-year law degree. But any student who is not ready to commit five years uh, after the school and who also want to keep their options open, they should ideally uh, choose the three-year BA legal studies honors. Right. So one of the, I should say, uh, uh, drawbacks even of five-year law program is your exit is only after five years. You don't get a degree after three years. So once you join a five-year law program, even if you complete nine semesters and somehow you have to leave the program, you don't get anything, you remain a class 12 pass out. In three plus three model, after three years, you get a BA honors degree. You can write civil services exam. You can move to management. You can move to other disciplines. At the same time, you have option to join LLB three-year program and become a qualified lawyer. So those students who are not having absolute clarity in their mind about studying law, I think they should go for a three-year BA legal studies honors degree. And also those who want to uh, form a foundation for a study of social sciences surrounding uh, law and legal studies. And one particular student group I would like to target for this program, those who are studying legal studies in class 11 and 12. You might be aware CBSC has introduced legal studies as one of the courses in uh, 11, 12th grade and it's taught all over the country in uh, uh, most of the leading schools. So those students can further build upon legal studies, uh, you know, if they choose a BA degree, BA honors degree. Right. Uh, there is one question that is linked with BA in legal studies. It says, what are the career prospects of this course? Oh, see, uh, frankly, with a three-year undergraduate degree, if you look for jobs, you will not be getting the best jobs, what you could secure with your uh, utilizing your full potential. You have to go for a good postgraduate uh, or professional degree. So for a BA legal studies graduate who wants to go for a job, they may explore to become paralegals or maybe, uh, you know, law clerks or, uh, I mean, uh, handling paralegal jobs in law firms and those kind of options. And uh, certainly those who want to build a legal career, that may not be the right thing to do to start with. At the same time, they are a graduate. So they are eligible to become anything which a graduate in our country uh, can uh, uh, you know, become, be it a, a bank officer or from anything. It's like any graduate degree. But the advantage is if he or she, a student wants to become a qualified lawyer, then the student has a strong foundation to study three-year LLB degree. 
and i strongly believe the students joining llb through the ba legal studies route they will be more profound and in a way more prepared to study law in all its manifestations and graduate as superior lawyers right um, also sir if you can touch upon the number of seats that ba llb bba llb and the three year llb program has. absolutely so in our law school we are actually a large law school we have 328 faculty we are actually the largest uh, law faculty in whole of asia our law faculty is more than 328 full time faculty members and it's almost double the size of any asian law school so we admit a class of 300 in our blb honors program that is five sections of 60 each we admit another 300 students in bblb honors program so five sections of 60 so as per bar council of india uh, regulations one class of llb could be a 60 student class so we admit 10 classes that way in blb and bblb and we have 600 seats in total for five year law program in three year llb we admit 180 students three sections of 60 students and there we get a lot of students even graduating from leading foreign universities uh, including the universities in the uk in the us in singapore in australia in new zealand a lot of countries there are and and mostly indian students who graduate from places even like uh, uh, say uh, many universities in boston in london in uh, 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 singapore anyways we have received a lot of graduates from those places who come to jindal to study three year llb degree so uh, we have uh, uh, quite good number of seats in both the programs and uh, we are also receiving very high quality students in my view i am seeing uh, admissions for last 9 years and the student quality has substantially improved and uh, i believe today we receive some of the finest law students studying in any law school in india or south asia right um, i'll take one more question sir uh, sure it says why has jindal opted for lsat oh very interesting <laughs> so this has a historical perspective in the year 2009 when jindal global law school started uh, professor c rajkumar who is our founding vice chancellor and uh, who is also who has been a rhodes scholar to oxford university and a graduate of harvard law school in the us and he was teaching in hong kong in city university and uh, he actually resigned his city university hong kong job to come to india and set up jindal global law school he always had a vision that the admission process uh, should be of international uh, standards and it should be a test score which should be recognized universally and not just in a particular country so because jindal was set up as a global law school a global or international law admission test was also uh, brought so lsat has been traditionally the most important law entrance exam of the world and uh, all american law schools and our partner universities uh, like harvard yale columbia they all admit through lsat so naturally uh, we approached and brought lsat to india and i must tell you uh, very candidly that the lsat is a superior and scientific test it doesn't ask questions uh, which can be learned by rote learning it, it, it doesn't ask gk and current affairs it doesn't ask mathematics or uh, uh, objective english or even uh, legal knowledge or legal gk or legal aptitude questions it asks purely reasoning logical reasoning analytical reasoning and reading comprehension so it's absolutely background neutral exam and uh, a scientific test of your logical abilities and your of course language abilities so and, and that is why what is needed for lawyers i mean lawyers do not need to know the potential lawyers that which year uh, i mean akbar was 
the king of the country or who was the first chief justice of India or who is the present chairman of National Human Rights Commission or questions like that. So I will encourage uh, the students attending this session to go to the website of LSAT India, it's discoverlaw.in. And on Discover Law website, they can find full length question papers of LSAT exam. And they can find the difference, like a typical GMAT or GRE exam, which is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, highest standard of testing uh, for any uh, university. Exactly. So that is the reason why we chose LSAT and we didn't go with uh, CLAT or any other existing Indian exam. Right. Um, I think uh, because looking at the clock, we'll have to wrap up the session, but uh, really interesting insights. Thank you so much for joining us, Professor Mishra, and speaking to the students, teachers, and parents who have joined us this evening. Uh, thanks to you. Actually, you made it possible. And uh, uh, I also thank Endeavor and Hitesh and uh, I mean, the, your entire team. So Thank you so God. much on behalf of our entire team. And all the very best to the students for their university admissions. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining in. So this is the Symposium 2020, where Professor Mishra just spoke to us about the various options that are available, the new age career options. Um, after class 12th, 2020 and beyond, this is first of its kind symposium where we are interacting online and the questions that we are asking our speakers, you could send in your questions too. You could reach out to us on WhatsApp. Our number is 9099-720-214. We ha have our next speaker here, who is from the Symbiosis School of Economics. She's the director, Dr. Jyoti Chandi Ramani. On behalf of the entire Endeavor Careers team, I virtually welcome you, ma'am, to Symposium 2020. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me on board with you. And I think this is the second time I'm coming across to Endeavor. So yes. thank you for reconsidering my, uh, you know, uh, a position and uh, giving me an opportunity to talk to so many students, you know, today. Definitely. And we are exploring this first of its kind digital interaction this time. So looking forward to a lot of students, teachers and parents interacting with you. Uh, before I hand over the mic virtually to Dr. Chandiramani, uh, just a little introduction of her. She has over 30 years of experience in teaching, institute building, administration and research. And she has to her credit, a lot of international associations, a couple of textbooks. And she's also the editor, the joint editor of a book on perspectives in urban development, issues in infrastructure planning and governance. So over to you, uh, Dr. Chandiramani, the mic is yours virtually. Thank you. I'll be sharing a PPT. Yeah. All right. Um, so that they could, you know, I could, that way I could talk about my institution. So just Perfect. let me get, get on to that. Yeah. And just a request, if you could make your PPT full screen, it would be easier for the viewers. Yeah. To yeah. yeah. I'll do that. Yeah, I'm just told. Sure, you need help, ma'am, or you find? Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying, looking for the, uh, you know, present, you know. It's the share screen button uh, in green. Yeah. So that would lead us to your computer screen. Yeah, that's true.
Is that fine? Visible? It's perfect, ma'am. Yeah. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. And sorry for the little technical glitch that took me a little time to figure this out. Um, I'm very happy to share with you, uh, you know, uh, careers in 2020 virtually uh, trying to tell you where and how you can move ahead and what you can do with yourselves, especially in the backdrop of COVID-19. Uh, while I'm sharing this uh, little PPT with you, I belong to Symbiosis, where I have spent more than 35 years, uh, you know, at Symbiosis. And I've literally been a part of the journey of an institution which is now into its 50th year. I've had the opportunity of nurturing Symbiosis School of Economics since 2010. It was born in 2008, but I was a part of that process. And as one moved on, one has taken it across to a particular level. I am also the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. And therefore, many of you must be wondering, you know, what is my career option? You know, is it STEM? Is it HAS? So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and medicine. And HAS is, you know, humanities, arts, and social sciences. And of course, in the present day, we find in India, a lot of people going in for HAS. Though STEM has got a lot of importance, but in a country of 1.38 billion people, uh, how can you not understand the human behavior? And HAS has a very big role to play. As I move on across to my slide, some of you must be wondering, what am I doing here? Why am I here? Where am I going? Where is this rail journey taking me forward to? At this moment, we are all locked down in our homes and really don't know where to go. We are at home thinking, wondering, pondering a while, and even more thought process onto what I should be doing. These questions keep coming up in our mind. In this very evolving world, there are constant questions that how am I going to be productive through and through? I'd like to tell you that since 16th of March, I have been at home. I haven't grown up in college with, with the kind of technology that you have grown up with. But I have adapted myself and though we are working from home, I don't see any task not being able to be carried out if I have my computer, I have internet, and I have the knowledge of technology where I can reach out despite the lockout. So here, we are in this very constantly evolving world, asking ourselves these questions, what is our future? How are we going to go? Which is this good education for us? What kind of education do I want? These days you hear about Coursera courses, you hear about Swayam courses, you hear about online courses, the MOOCs, etc. And then you wonder, do I really need to go to college? Or what do I need to do? And you must have heard about Facebook and Google who employ people even without them completing their graduation. But I do think, well, that is an option that you could try out. But belonging to a university, belonging to an institution, um, you know, uh, having a peer team to discuss with, having that kind of intellectual input is undoubtedly very, very useful. We go on to asking what kind of education, what is the job I'm going to get? What am I going to get paid? Will I be able to take care of myself as I move on into a very complex setup? Like a lot of people have lost their jobs today, but there are a lot of people who are still able to retain their jobs and are able to function. And for that, what kind of an education do I need? So I always give one word of advice to all my students. Choose a, choose a job you love. Choose an academic profession you are passionate about. And you will never have to, you know, feel bad about a day of your life as to what you're going to do because you're going to move around with the passion. 
either for the academics or for the kind of job that you have. Now, to, to have the kind of passion for your job, you must have that kind of skill sets. And therefore, I'm sure many of you have read the book, What Color Is Your Parachute? And there have been a number of such lovely questions that are posed always there. And some thoughts that come up my way is, always define what you want to do with your life and what you have to offer to the world in terms of your favorite talent, gifts, skills, not in terms of just job title. I was just reading a WhatsApp message about one of my colleagues who has an MBA, who's the director of an MBA in Pune, the SIBM, and his student who's a part of the program has come up with a ventilator, which is a low cost ventilator. He was so elated, he was so happy that, you, that his student was able to make a difference in society at the right point of time. So I think as social change makers, as people in what kind of careers we go, we need to see what kind of skill sets, what kind of jobs, what kind of talent we need to need to imbibe so that we make an impact in society as we move on. I do feel each one of us are great change makers and we need to be realistic about the world that we are living in. So when you are choosing your institution, when you are choosing your academic program, I feel it's very, very essential for you to follow any kind of a program which looks into the RPI model and prepares you for a DAXA outcome. Now, this is a kind of a little quiz that you, know, you must be wondering, what is Jyoti talking about this RPI model and DAXA outcome? Well, let me take you through this journey ahead. And as you look at this journey, this RPI model is, you have to do an academic program post your 12th in something that's going to be very academically strong. This strength has to be there in the kind of program structure that you are going to be dealing with. Uh, the program should have a very strong component of research. This is some of the very characteristics and traits that are there at the Sibiasis School of Economics. The academic curriculum is strong, the research which allows you for critical thinking is excellent. I can see that our 1300 plus alumni are doing very well. And that's because we have stitched together a program which has a lot of inputs, which I shall explain to you as we move on. So it's the, the kind of RPI model that Symbiosis School of Economics has is a strong academics with a strong research, uh, placing our students in society in a way where they are placed as good citizens and they are also placed with good employability. And at the same time, we would like to ensure that our students are capable of being internationalized. When I say internationalized, I mean that they are able to be absorbed in a global order with the kind of education and skill sets that they have. And we believe in symbiosis that we ensure that there is an enhanced engagement with different stakeholders of society. We are connected with the Niti Aayog, we are connected with the government of Maharashtra, we are connected with Nabad, we are connected with people residing in slums. In fact, some of our students had done research on the public health systems that are existing in Pune. Some of them go on to landfills to see how waste management is collected in the city of Pune. This kind of experiential learning helps them to be able to understand what all can economics touch. And whether it's economics, whether it is philosophy, whether it is sociology, I think they all have a certain connect in society that needs to improve the livability of mankind. Moving ahead from the RPI model, we come to this new uh, system that I've talked about, which is DAXA. And that's there right in front of you. Today, are we not there in a dynamic kind of a setup? Can you not see how 
a, a, a virus which was in China has been transported across almost 200 countries across the world. A, a, an environment which is so full of uncertainties, which is putting us through so much of challenges. We are groping with knowledge out here as to what kind of vaccines that we can use. We need to see that we create skill sets. We need to see that we have the right kind of attitude that people understand what is happening. And we need to understand, even remember uh, when uh, the close down was announced and you saw a lot of migrant workers going back and we said, oh my gosh, why are they doing this? We need to understand where they come from. We need to be sensitized. So we need to understand their attitude. And only then are you going to be able to be, bring about the right kind of policy framework that needs to be addressed. Um, well, um, when I talk to you about the RPI model and the DAXA framework offered at under the Symbiosis International Deemed University by the Symbiosis School of Economics, where Symbiosis, the society where we belong to, the, the trust that we belong to, looks at providing facilities for education and research of a standard and a class which is globally recognized uh, where knowledge is given its great importance and status and the dissemination creation of knowledge is absolutely um, given its topmost priority. I think this is a university that you cannot afford to ignore. Symbiosis has a lot of UG programs. While I'm here to talk about the School of Economics, I heard that the earlier gentleman talked to you about law and Symbiosis also has an excellent law college. It has an excellent liberal arts college, a college which also offers a number of BBA programs in Pune, in Noida and in Nagpur. So moving ahead, uh, Dr. Muzumdar, our founder who has had the courage to dream and he dared to dream so tall that along with his dreams, he has created generations who have been able to carry the good work from this university and from the various institutions into the society. And what a great alumni network we have where each one of our alumni are making such a contribution to society. So here is where I was talking to you about symbiosis about Symbiosis School of Economics, about the DAXA effect, about the RPI model. And now I come to SSC, Symbiosis School of Economics, celebrating 10 years. And in these 10 years, in fact, we, we celebrated 10 years in 2018 and now into our 12th year. Where are we moving? In which direction? What do we offer? At the School of Economics, we have a brilliant program. I think one of the best undergrad programs in the country, the BSc Economic Honors. And uh, we also offer an MSc Economics and the PhD coursework. But I think for you, you're more concerned with the BSc Economics that we are offering. So then you may ask, why do I need to study economics at SSC? And there, is where I come in. We have 1300 alumni who can endorse our journey that we have taken over the years. And we have more than 558 students at this junction. We are going to increase our intake over a period of time because we're going to move to a slightly bigger campus. We have a student diversity from all over, from more than 27 states, from more than I think almost three to four continents have got included. We have wonderful Afghani students who couldn't speak English and now learn to speak English at our school. We have students from Syria, you know, from, from the, you know, where there was conflict and they have come to a peace zone so that they can take their careers ahead. So we have a great amount of student diversity at our school. And what does the curriculum offer us? The curriculum offers us core economics, which is micro, macro, Indian economics, development economics, environmental economics, international economics, economic thought. The quantitative studies offers you mathematics, statistics, applied mathematics and statistics to economics, uh, 
introductory econometrics, intermediary econometrics, as well as operations research. Research methods is an absolutely integral part of our work. In fact, at the end of the three years, our students would have made more than 30 presentations. We would have written more than 35 assignments. And they would say that SSE has prepared them for the road ahead, for the journey ahead, to take care of any kind of written work, experiential learning, interdisciplinary framework. Our students learn business accounting, environment science, public policy and administration, international relations. These are some of the interdisciplinary courses. We have two very brilliant centers, the Center for Academic Writing and the Center for Quantitative Application. The quantitative application connects you with the quantitative studies. And of course, a lot of IT softwares like Excel, Stata, SAS, R, which is an open source, MATLAB, etc. Um, at SSE, the curriculum has been over the period of time evolved. It's not static, it keeps changing and it keeps upgrading in, in, in course of time. It is engaging in pedagogy. We have two internships. We have research projects. We have semester exchange programs. And no graduate student of ours can graduate without dissertations. So here, let me tell you something. That our students, while the lockdown happened, our students actually sent in their dissertations in Google Classroom. We reviewed it. We connected with them either on Zoom or on Google Meet. They sent us their presentations and like how I'm presenting to you, they presented to us. We did a plagiarism check of their dissertations and they have done brilliant work over a year for a dissertation. Now this kind of dissertation helps you to do research, helps you to, to do critical thinking, and this helps you to decide and and choose your topics of research, something that you're very passionate about. It could entail primary study, it could entail secondary data and all of it. So we, as I told you, we do have interdisciplinary frameworks. I won't repeat that. And our education equips you with the three R's. I've already discussed that, that you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of writing, at the end, remember I talked to you about the Center for Academic Writing and the Center for Quantitative Skills. So reading, writing, arithmetic, the three hours of academia, three hours of education are right there for you. As we move on the journey at SSE, I'm going to leave this PPT with Satya and he can share it with you, uh, with Endeavors and they can share it with you. But the journey has been really, truly a, a very engaging journey. We've created three kinds of brands and those three kind of sub brands are in 2014, we instituted the Suresh Tendulkar Memorial Lecture. For those of you who are wondering what that is, Professor Suresh Tendulkar has defined poverty in India and he is a Punekar and we, institute, we took permission from his family and have instituted a Tendulkar Memorial Lecture, which the sixth of it was just concluded, tall stalwarts from India, from abroad, come and present over here. The students every year have, there's not just all work, but there's a lot of play too. The students have created their own fest, which is called Equilibria. And that's beautifully managed by them under the guidance of a faculty. And then in 2019, we instituted in our 10th year, 1819, FICO, which is Future of Employment Challenges and Opportunities, because that's precisely why you're here. You wonder what kind of an academic you know, profile I need so that I can have employability for the rest of my life. And that's what we did in this, this whole journey from 2008 to 2020. And while we are at it, at this point, many of you must be wondering, how can we come to Pune? Pune is a COVID center. What are we going to be doing? How can we take admissions? Please be active and check onto our website. Our website will be giving you updates shortly. 
we will be having our set exam which would be shortly postponed and we will tell you about the new date um based on that uh already our teachers have started preparing online teaching material so you may if if the covid continues we will be sending this material to our students online so for the first semester maybe see it's not going to continue for 3 years so if we have a bad time maybe the first semester may start late but the study will go on in june so the semester commences on 29th of of june and it will commence even if the covid is alive because many of us are working from home making very active presentations for for all of our students we use online content presentation youtube uh, google hangouts google meet you know uh, google google uh, uh, you know classroom where all our students push in their assignments where we give them quizzes etc so there's a lot of online engagement so do not worry this is going to be a great journey and i think what is great is that we have our team at symbiosis school of economics is indeed brilliant brilliant teachers brilliant staff and that's what our students say they say that the faculty is so engaging that the intellectual inputs that you get at symbiosis is unparalleled that is why i told you it is one of the best programs in the country the bsc economic honors which has been on since 2008 and has evolved to be one of the best programs in the country symbiosis as you all know is a great institution and again Uh, I'll just wind up by telling you that research in our institution is in a few areas. It is in urban, it is in rural, it is international studies, it is behavioral. Uh, today we talk about why people behave: the behavioral finance, the behavioral economics, of uh, you know behavioral sciences and its application to every field of social sciences, and of course social science research. our journey has moved ahead we moved from 2010 to date in a very uh, the, the the decade has had its uh, great journey in fact if you go on to our website you will find the 10th year coffee book which will give you all insights the brochure and the um, brochure giving you information about the curriculum etc is all there on the website and you there is even contact numbers for the bsc admission program there is a mobile number you can connect with everybody over there and we look forward to to being engaged with you on this count i say thank you jai hind look forward to seeing you in pune and hope that you can write in to me with all your queries and i'll be happy to answer them thank you so much thank you so much that's up to my time right you did you did and uh, we do have a couple of minutes more so there were some questions pouring in for you so maybe we could take a couple of them if you're ready for that yeah sure so there's one question which says what is the difference between bba in economics and bsc in economics bba in economics is really coming from a management stream okay uh it is it is not from the faculty of humanities and social sciences a lot of institutions marry economics into management of course because uh economics cannot be divorced from anything even when you are doing research there is the economics of research so bba is economics which is applied economics to management but a bsc economics is a pure economics and now your i'd like to say that the kind of curriculum that we've created you know is so um it's so solid it's got all those nutrients you know that at the end of this program you could be um you could join an mba program you could do masters in economics you can do masters in international relations you can move into media you can move into journalism you can move into finance you can move into hr you can actually you can go anywhere you can take part in the csr initiatives of various companies 
you could be an economist with a corporate so when you talk about bba from management it is economics not of the highest level but when you say it is bsc economics the economics is at the core and right on top and that's where the quantitative skills that's where economics is more of a science because it is married to you know um statistics and mathematics and therefore it becomes a decision making science right um there are general questions which talk about uh, if you can just touch upon the cutoffs and the placements and the intake at ssc the intake is 130 at the moment hmm. um we are likely to increase it okay uh, it's gone to the um it's gone to the um, academic council and the board of management for approval and i don't think that should be a problem uh the cutoffs vary each year um, because it depends upon the set paper that is a you know a symbiosis entrance test and that's the general framework and in the general framework it it varies each year so a cutoff has generally been above 100 a score of above 100 and uh, that's on the cut off about placements uh, we do have placements this year it hasn't been very good because of covid because wherever certain offers i have to be frank with you right and i need to be brutally honest because of covid a lot of companies have decided to back off because if they don't know what the what is going to be their future how long the lockdown is they are not willing to take students this long so a lot of our students are engaged in coursera courses they are, they are you know taking up more courses so that they get more skilled so that by the time the open up happens uh, they'll get prepared to work in what i call the gig economy you know the gig economy where you take up some kind of a project you finish it then you take up the next project and you get a, and as you get better you get paid much more and you become like a little consultant you know so i think that's the way it's going to evolve employment is going to change it's not going to be the 9 to 5 job that you're talking about it's going to be so much digitized computerized technology is going to be there online etc so uh, with placements we have let me say say if i have a class of 130 all right 130 students i would say about 30 of them look for placements 100 of them out of the 130 at least 10 12 will not not clear the course in the first go because there is a certain quality benchmark it's easy to get into simbiosis school of economics but the academics is so strong that it's difficult to get out and i feel very proud to say that uh but a large number of our students make it to very good institutions so whether it is iim ahmedabad iim bangalore iim lucknow iim indore uh, many of my students have even you know one of my first batch students has completed his phd and is an assistant professor with iim rohtak and he's written an article on on covid uh, we have people who are doing their phd's we have people who've gone abroad and been with columbia university and done international relations they've gone to lse they've gone to warwick so when it comes to academics i have a lot to say when it comes to placements my students are not really interested in placements nobody stops at a b bsc economics because i think everybody is aspiring to study a lot more but we have a placement officer we have a faculty in charge of placement who takes care of placements as counseling that goes on around the year students are trained to write their cvs uh, the students are trained for interviews and group discussions students are trained with skill sets writing quantitative abilities data analytics etc you know prof professional skill set so that they are ready for the job market and my bsc students stand a way above the rest i would say they they really do well and i'm very proud to say that you know absolutely um while you already touched this upon a little but uh, there's one question which says what's the difference between ba in economics and bsc in economics and what is the kind of profile that i can expect after a graduation in either of them 
uh, well, a BA in economics um, is really a, a BA arts, you know, Bachelor of Arts. And whereas when we say BSc, we say Bachelor of Science, you know, in economics. So when you take this to Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Science, and then you talked about a BBA economics, which is management and economics. So we leave aside that. In Bachelor of Arts, A, it may be very quantitative. It may not be quantitative. Depends if you're going to Kolkata University and any of the affiliated colleges over there, they may not be offering a BSc, they may be offering a BA. But most of the universities, most of the colleges affiliated uh, from West Bengal generally offer a BSc economics. Um, in BSc economics, we feel that it has got more of the science in it. Science, social sciences. Therefore, the decision making becomes very strong. Therefore, things like uh, mathematics, statistics, applied mathematics, applied statistics, introductory econometrics, operations, research, et cetera, comes in. Then the courses on data analytics, IT and its application, et cetera, come in. Uh, so that makes it even more scientific. And what we do is we are one of the few you know, institutions which talk about research methods at an undergraduate level, because that helps you to put down a research question. It tells you what kind of tools you're going to apply and how you're going to solve problems. So therefore, I think a BS economics is a more scientific way of problem solving, you know. Yeah. And that though we talk about it as economics, um, I think even a housewife is an economist, you know? So I, I, I mean, uh, it touches upon everybody's life. Economics penetrates into the life of everybody a student has a pocket money and therefore he, he or she decides that this is my budget on which i need to function so whether it's a student whether it's a mother the mother opens a fridge every day in the morning and she sees what's in the refrigerator and decides what to cook so that's her production function what is the input that's going to give you the output you know definitely um uh, that was an amazing session ma'am but uh, looking at the time that we have i think we'll have to wrap up the questions here but thank you so much it it really cleared a lot of confusions and anxieties that the students might have right now and they should look up to the website right for any changes in yes. the day yes and there is a you know a admissions email id and if there's anything that they want to know they can write in and they would find responses to that immediately there's a mobile number as well as an admissions email ID. Looking okay. forward, have a great day and stay safe, all of you. <laughs> Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining in. Thank you. I'll leave the meeting now. Thank you for yeah. having me. Thank you, ma'am. All right, so thank you so much everyone who has uh, joined us for Symposium 2020. This is the part two, wherein uh, we've listened to three eminent speakers already. And we have uh, Professor Bishwa Kalyan Dash who has joined us. Um, uh, he is representing the Institute of Law, Nirma University. Um, so these three speakers who already spoke with us, we did take up a lot of questions. So if in case you have any questions about law or anything that you want to clear, you can reach out to Endeavor Careers on our WhatsApp number, which is 9099720214. And we will make sure that these questions are taken up. Our expert speakers answer these questions. Um, while Professor Dash joins us, here's a little, intro in little introduction that I would like to give you about him. So prior to joining Nirma, he has served as a research fellow in the Common Cell Government of India and also as a faculty at NLU Odisha. Human rights is his area of specialization. So the students, teachers and parents have joined us this evening. If you want to know anything about his specialization or more questions about how to join Nirma University's Institute of Law, feel free to WhatsApp us on the number that I just mentioned. Um, so here's a virtual welcome to you, Professor Dash, on behalf of uh, the entire Endeavor Careers team. And I would like to virtually hand over the mic to you now so that you could interact with the students, teachers, and parents who have joined us this evening. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening to all uh, who are uh, joining us over this platform. 
So myself, uh, uh, Dr. Vishwakalyan Das, and uh, I'm an assistant professor at the Institute of Law, Dipma University. Uh, so I would be using the next uh, few minutes to interact with you regarding the career perspective that we have uh, uh, after plus two in terms of law field. And when we talk about law field, uh, we are uh, very much skeptical from the very beginning about uh, thinking law as a career perspective. And uh, moreover, there has been a great amount of dilemma as to whether it should be taken as such uh, uh, as a perspective. Uh, so my mic uh, is this working right now? Yeah, you are audible, sir. Okay, so is this working fine, Satya? Yes, I think there's some bandwidth issue. So there's some audio issue, but you are audible for sure. Okay. Uh, this is fine. So actually, the mic uh, of the system was a bit louder. So I just adjusted it to normal. No, it's perfect. So sorry. hope it will be fine right now. It's perfect. Okay. So uh, I would be having a discussion on three limbs that uh, uh, what law is to be and what it is now. And second, what, whether it should be taken as a career perspective as such. And third, what are the all options available in terms of law career? And fourth, I would be talking about what should be the proper channel to uh, pursue that career. And with respect to the same thing, I would be entertaining all the questions that you may have uh, at the end of my discussion. And uh, uh, the synchronization of my topic would be uh, my talk would be like uh, as such uh, law has been taken as a uh, transversal uh, stream of uh, professional uh, approach, but at the same time law has uh, in the recent past year of uh, in a lot of momentum when we talk about uh, the career perspective it does provide and after the market that has been opened up uh, for the foreign players to come into the Indian circumstances and economy being uh, gearing up and uh, all aspects of life having some say or the other with respect to legal control. That requires a lot of intervention from the people who are going to be in the law field. And that provides a huge opportunity and a plethora of options to be chosen from. And for this reason, uh, now law has not been considered anymore as one other option uh, that whoever is not having anything in hand may go on to law. So this has uh, come a huge way from being uh, as considered to be the last option to be considered as one of the options uh, for the students. Now talking about this next uh, limb of it, that when we talk about uh, uh, what should be taken as a career point of view, we need to uh, look into the fact that uh, uh, the career perspectives has to do a lot of uh, fragmentations that uh, if you are going to pursue a law, where do you want to pursue it from? And how do you want to pursue it from? What do you want to do it after completion of your five year law course? Because it's a huge time that you would be investing on your studies. And for this reason, uh, you have to definitely devolve a lot of uh, your own uh, research about uh, the various perspectives and the plethora of opportunities. Next thing is like, what are the opportunities that is available? Like, uh, where do you want to see after the completion of five years? Now, it provides ample of opportunities starting from the bar to the bench to the multinational companies to in house counsels to uh, researchers to faculties and uh, legal academician and all such uh, other things. Now, we'll be discussing one after the other all these career opportunities that we have. And also, like uh, to reach there, you have to pursue through a proper planned uh, action. Now, your action plan has to be pretty much uh, uh, synchronized, structured, and workable. Now, for this reason, you have to start from the, uh, 12th standard onwards when you are trying to see law as a career perspective. That means I would be presuming that your all mind uh, is there, that you are going for one. Now, for this reason, uh, you need to understand that uh, what are things has to be done and what are those do's and don'ts that you have to pursue. and uh, in uh, finding out the best places which will be giving you the right direction which might end you up uh, to your desired destination so these are the questions sir, that we'll be discussing with you and uh, for that reason i'm here i'm here to answer all your queries that you have in terms of law career if you have any questions then we can have a discussion now 
is that fine or do i need to extend it uh, completely um we are fine as long as you have covered everything that you no, want i have covered because i have also made a ppt so i'll be presenting it tomorrow i will be sharing the screen so i would be uh, comfortably be using it so yeah please feel free to go ahead then so the complete duration that you want to so me to cover up uh, uh i do have a couple of questions that have already reached us but whatever is comfortable to you no you can tell me then i'll just reserve myself because i was in between some other uh, meeting <laughs> oh okay uh, that's that i uh, mentioned uh, satya all right um so yeah uh, as long as you have covered everything that you wanted to speak with our right. students teachers and parents who have joined us um there are some questions um out of which one says how many seats does the institute of law near my university have so uh, we do have uh, 240 seats but we have notified for 300 seats that would be divided into 180 seats for uh, uh, ba llp and 120 for bcom llp but uh, this year we have increased uh, 60 seats for uh, the ba course and uh, that is subject to the approval of bar council of india we are expecting an approval shortly okay uh, there's there's one parent who is asking how is nirmal's course different from other colleges okay uh, so uh, when we talk about the uh, contemporary legal education it is more of a blend of practical approaches rather than a conventional legal education the conventional legal education has been uh, clearly distinguished from what pci expects us that is the minimum expectation plus what extra that we can give to the students to match up to the global standards and for this reason uh, institute of law in my university has come up with various courses like uh, skill based education we have skill labs we have research center collaborations where in the students are exposed to do their uh, research apart from what they have been studying in their classrooms we do have practical session we do have legal aid sessions we do have uh, mood code orientations and uh, compulsory mood code sessions for every student so where in the and we also have uh, professional education courses like uh, we have categorized four segments wherein the professional courses have been offered depending on the choice of the student that uh, whether they want to go for the corporate they want to go for the judiciary they want to go for litigation or they want to go for any higher studies now in such segment the students have uh, been given a choice what they want to and they have been handheld all throughout the five years depending on their career goals and objectives so uh, which is uh, quite an innovative step uh, that uh, most of the uh, european uh, colleges are uh, following right now right um and can if you can just touch upon some important dates regarding the admissions and the exams and uh, do you foresee any changes because of the current uh, covid 19 uh, situation uh, precisely ma'am uh, this will definitely change because uh, uh, we are expect we generally expect by now all the examinations the board examination would have been over so that uh, because as we take admissions through clat and it is completely dependent on the clat uh, time table and uh, clat results are something which is vital for us now the clat has uh, moved from 10th may to uh, 24th of may so now we have a huge uh, bracket to check so first and foremost thing that every board examination has to be over second thing clat has to be over so that the students will be having the minimum eligibility criteria to take an admission into law so definitely there would be some uh, variation that we can foresee in the near future with respect to uh, the time table with respect to the declaration of results and with respect to the admission sessions right uh, and all the updates we can find on the website yes uh, we uh, you definitely be getting it online and you'll definitely be getting it on all the platforms wherever nirma is hosting uh, its informations all right uh, we'll take just two more questions and then uh, yes, we can call it a session so uh, there's one question which says can the student opt out after 3 years will we get a ba degree if we opt out no uh, we do not have that option right now because uh, opting out uh, is not uh, been practicable it used to be there uh, as per the ugc regulation 4 uh, years back but now it's not been uh, there so opting out will not entail you with a ba degree uh, uh, but uh, for that you can choose something apart from law as integrated law all right uh, can you just touch upon the placement part a bit and then we can oh, call sure. it a session sure so uh, 
as I already have stated that we have customized uh, positions with respect to what the career objectives of the students are. So what we have been seeing that uh, uh, like the people uh, who are coming up for uh, placements, their number is uh, quite uh, certain. So it's not a whole chunk of the whole batch is coming for the placements. But uh, out of the placements, what we have been seeing for the last three years data I will be giving. So it's like 85 to 90% touch upon we are doing. But we cannot assure you that thing because uh, that is something which is dependent on uh, the market, which is dependent on the credentials that the students hold, and which is also dependent on the bridge, bridging the gap that we have been doing for the institutional level. But what we can see, uh, surely say that uh, we do have a dedicated uh, center, which is uh, the campus recruitment cell, which has been monitored and supervised by one of the faculty members itself, and which has been run by the students themselves. So what they have been doing for the last uh, couple of years is tremendous work, and we have been seeing uh, like outstanding results. But at the same time, as I said, the market is going to be really uh, crashed down in next few months. So by the time we are not looking for the uh, passing out batch, but we are talking about the 2024 batch. So definitely it will be uh, a very good scenario by then. All right. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Professor Dash. And I'm sure uh, the insights that you shared would have helped the students, parents, and teachers who have joined us for, live for the digital symposium. So thank on so behalf much. of my entire team, uh, I'm grateful that you joined us. Thank you so much, ma'am. Have a good day. You too. Thank you so thank much. You. So thank you so much, uh, all the students, teachers, parents who have joined us on this Saturday evening for this symposium 2020 part two. And here's the good news. Part two has just ended, but part three, we will be coming up with it really shortly. And uh, this is an initiative by Endeavor Careers where we intend to connect students like you, parents like you, teachers like you with institutes that really matter. The experts talking about their courses themselves so that if you have any confusions, any doubts, any anxieties about what should you do after your class 12, the results would soon be here, but you still don't know what career you should go for. All your confusions would be solved in Symposium 2020, the series that is first of its kind digital webinar series that is hosted by Endeavor Careers. While these mentors join us, also, please feel free to visit our website, which is endeavorcareers.com. In case if you missed a part of the symposium or if you want to refer to our earlier symposiums, you could also visit Endeavor Careers on YouTube and you would find all the videos there. Um, having said that, thank you so much for taking out time for things that really, really matter and joining us this evening. We look forward to having you again with us for the part three, where different speakers from prestigious institutes would be joining us. Thank you so much on behalf of entire Endeavor Careers team. Dream, Endeavor, Achieve.